We live in a world where we are constantly observing ourselves from orbit. We don't even think twice about the satellite surveillance of our world because it's us doing it. But imagine if we were being watched by someone else, far before the dawn of the space age by some unknown agent. More, think of a scenario where it was watching us, and we were inadvertently with our astronomical photographic plates watching it as well. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched humanity's first orbital satellite, Sputnik 1, ushering in the age of telecommunications and satellites of all flavor from weather to espionage. But our ability to monitor the skies photographically stretches decades before the advent of human space travel leaving us with an enormous collection of astronomical survey plates to study. Within these plates, previous to 1957, you shouldn't expect to find anything transient presenting itself as a satellite since we didn't yet have them. But that's apparently not the case. In a photographic plate dating from 1950, my guest today has identified a transient phenomenon that not only appears like a satellite would, but actually tracks across the plate exactly as you would expect a satellite in orbit of Earth would do. Now, there have been conspiracy theories floating around on the internet, such as the Black Knight regarding satellites previous to the space age. But these are urban legends that conflate different sources, usually coupled with a photograph of a very human-made thermal blanket in orbit. But there is a kernel of something here. There was one such mention of the possibility of artificial satellites of unknown origin before the space age began that was made by Major Donald Kehoe, a prominent figure in the early days of ufology reporting that the U.S. government was aware of two such satellites. If there was any truth to that report is unknown, but it's interesting nonetheless. Adding to this mystery, there are obscure oddities hidden within the history of science that may deepen this mystery. One of these are the mysterious signals Nikola Tesla reported picking up that he thought were of alien origin, though in reality it could just as easily have been pulsars or any of the other myriad of natural radio sources that were unknown in his day. But there's also the case of the long, delayed echoes in radio, where transmissions repeat back to the transmitter, often seconds afterward as an echo. Echoes in radio are not uncommon. The ionosphere loves doing things like that, but a delay of seconds raises eyebrows. Does something repeat or reflect our signals back to us occasionally? But setting that aside, astronomers looking for transients in photographic plates and then have it result in a detection is in itself astonishing. They simply should not be there, and in 1950, no one on Earth was anywhere close to the capability of putting a satellite in orbit. And it's not just one candidate, but three, that really do appear to line up in a non-random way, and not as a result of a defect in the plate, though this still needs to be confirmed. Whatever these objects were is a complete unknown. So the question is open, were we being watched? You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Beatrice Villarreal. Dr. Villarreal studies astrophysics and astroparticle physics as a Nordic fellow at Nordica, the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics. She has served as the lead on multiple papers using existing survey data to find examples of exceptional astrophysical transients, including looking for physically impossible effects caused by highly advanced technology. Beatrice Villarreal, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Now, Beatrice, you have a recent paper out, um, another in a series on transient phenomena in photographic plates. And this particular one is, is of particular interest because these are plates that predate the space age and look for, you know, you were looking for objects that transiently appear that shouldn't have been present because nothing should have been in geosynchronous orbit around Earth. Now, could you give us an overview of that paper and what you found? So, um... There's a background to this paper, and that is that um, in last year, in 2021, uh, Vasco published a paper where we found nine star-like objects appearing and disappearing within half an hour. So like multiple transients in an image. 
So this image was like very confusing because there is nothing that sh that astrophysically should permit this to happen. So um, we did then a lot of tests. We ruled out a lot of explanations. Uh, we couldn't rule out absolutely every explanation, but um, all the astrophysical explanations were gone. And we were thinking maybe, maybe there is some type of uh, contamination that produces star-like objects. However, we are not aware of any such contamination. Um, it was like one hypothesis, and the second hypothesis is that maybe there is some new kind of phenomenon that we discovered. And one of these maybe could be related to that you have reflections of uh, uh, highly reflective and flat objects in high altitude around the Earth. Because today we know that if you have uh, a lot of space debris, you can get fast glints, something that looks like a transient in an image. So in, like, in a modern survey, it wouldn't be anything weird to, to see multiple transients. However, our image was from 1950, like seven years before Sputnik 1. So that was the first paper. And then, so in order to test this hypothesis, uh, we wrote a new paper where we did some statistical analysis of how can you actually uh, test for this hypothesis. And that is by looking for uh, not only multiple transients in an image, but those that fall on a line or uh, like happen within a narrow stripe to show that they are not random in an image. Let's say if you find four lying on a line or five uh, lying on a line and you need at least four for it to be uh, very unlikely. So we actually carried out this test. Uh, it was a fast test for us to do since we have the Vasco project where we look for transients. And we found some interesting examples which are not uh, um, let's say we cannot confirm their, their authenticity. Maybe there is still some type of randomness and some highly unlikely um, alignments that we simply got by chance. Or maybe they are actually uh, um, real, like real. And well, that is what this paper is about, is that we found uh, some candidates that we didn't expect to find at the same time as they are not that strong that you just by statistics can say, yeah, this is real. They are in this kind of gray zone area where you still need to follow up on them. Now, how do you follow up? What is, what's the plan to check the plates? For example, if there's some sort of debris on the plate or whatever, uh, what is the next step in determining whether these things are really there or not? So, so far, uh, we have not been lucky when it comes to direct access to the plates. Um, because uh, there have been pandemic restrictions and also uh, these plates, uh, photographic plates, are so valuable that they don't uh, give visitors direct access, which is something that I actually would like to have when I uh, analyze them. I want, want to be present during the analysis. So, now, is it possible that there are other plates that you could look at, for example, like the Vatican um, Observatory's plates that go back that far? I mean, can you sort of say, well, I don't have access to these plates, but maybe I can have access to another set of plates. This is exactly what we are thinking about. And uh, to find a plate collection identified, some, some, some plate collection that is both digitized and where the original plates are accessible uh, to the regular astronomer. And I think if we do that and can find a similar example in one of those, we could actually test it. So that's one of the ideas we are working with. Like now, stop. now, what led you to the conclusion that what you were seeing in this this set of plates was in geosynchronous orbit? Um, so, um, if you would have something in a low orbit, it's going to produce streaks on the plate rather than any, like, let's say, fast glints. But while if this kind of very fast reflections are something typical for an object that is highly reflective and flat and is in a high altitude uh, orbit, like geosynchronous orbit. And uh, we simply thought that this could be something that one can look for, something that you will not confuse with a asteroid or anything else. So it's more that we have carried out a hypothesis test to look for these things. Um, rather than that we have found something and uh, applied the interpretation of that. Now, high albedo, meaning highly reflective. Now, this 
sort of stands in contrast to an asteroid. Now, to preface this, there was a, a, an incident, I think in the early 20th century, called the Great Meteor Procession, where people observed, multiple observers saw multiple meteors um, falling one after another in the atmosphere. And it was reported in newspapers, especially, I think, in Canada. And this suggested that there might have been a disintegrating asteroid that briefly was in Earth orbit or something of that nature. So it seems to me, though, that if you're looking at an asteroid, it would not be high albedo. It would be reddened, right? So exactly. this, this looks exactly the opposite of what you would expect from a natural uh, rock. Exactly. So that's why we wrote this Act Astronautica paper, like how to find something that you cannot confuse with anything natural, like these glints on a line or, and so. So how does this compare to something like a solar panel? I mean, if, if we're looking at a satellite today, you know, that's the, you know, Starlink satellite or whatever, or something that has a, a large solar array, does the albedo sort of look similar to, to what we, you know, our technology, our modern technology? Uh, I actually don't know what is the albedo for solar panel, but I know that uh, many satellites are rotating pretty fast and you would see a lot of glints, not only four or five, but you would maybe see like a long, um, um, like a pearl band of glints. Or maybe you would even see like dashed lines uh, from such a satellite. And while in the case of space debris, where you have maybe that it, uh, it not only spins, it also has a precession, you could produce just a few glints in a line. So I would see such a difference. So if it's something, then I wouldn't expect it to be a, a satellite that is big and fastly spinning. Now, how many objects did you see in the plate? We. We found 83 uh, candidates like with like multiple glints. However, we cannot say if all of them are real or if a single one of them is real. Um, but this 83 was the result of this, the automatized survey. However, we had extremely uh, narrow constraints when we looked for them. So what we also plan to do is to relax these constraints. Then we will find many more candidates and we have to uh, follow up on these candidates with the citizen science project. So this will be implement implemented in the next step of the Vasco citizen science to look for better candidates uh, with these more relaxed constraints. Now, what's that going to look like, a citizen science project? Now, I, I have taken part in these, of course. Um, one was the planet hunters that discovered the weird star KIC 8462852, where you look at Kepler light curves. And now this is ongoing with TESS and you know, many other areas. Now, what would it look like, a citizen science project? What would the the person that taking part in it, what would, what would they do to look for these transients? So right now we have a citizen science project where the, and, and the citizen can be looking at two images, one from 1950s and one that is modern from pan stars and can say if a star has vanished. So in the next edition, what I would like to do is to not, not ask the user to say if a star has vanished, but to look at the, the images where we know that stars have an, vanished due to these automated methods we also use and mark how many and if they are aligned or if they are random. And in this way, we will be able to um, single out the most interesting aligned candidates if they are four stars on a line or five stars or 15. Now, Beatrice, how would you describe the shapes? In other words, what are these things, you know, modeling them, what do they look like? So, um, so these shapes uh, were simulated by Hishan Gregori, who was a PhD student at that time uh, in Algeria. Now he's already a doctor. Uh, congratulations, Hishan, by the way. And uh, so he uh, used a um, simulation software called Blender to like trying to see what kind of shapes uh, could produce the glinting pattern that we see. Like, depending, of course, in, in, he introduced a spin, a precession also. And uh, it turns out that there are five different shapes that he could identify. I'm sure maybe there are even more. Uh, one of them is like a double pyramid that is kind of dark, but has some type of um, ref reflective uh, uh, corner at the edge. Then you can also have a complex shape where, you, where most of the thing is kind of 
dark, but then you have this slightly, um, or sorry, this highly reflective little uh, plate uh, in the middle of it, or sometimes uh, maybe two even plates that are highly reflective in the, in, up in, in the middle or in the edge of the object. So there are different ways how you can produce this kind of glints. It's nothing uh, specifically unique. And uh, we can maybe even show for the interested ones some type of simulations on how these glints can be produced. Now, in regards to these objects, so say you can confirm it by looking at other photographic plates. Is it possible to do a search today to see if they are still there? Absolutely. And I think it would be even necessary to start doing this already now, because if you have the shapes um, and you have modern instrumentation, you will know what is the difference between the old instrumentation from 1950s that were used, where you had 50 minutes of exposures, and the modern instrumentation, where you have, let's say, much shorter exposure times. So you're going to see something else. Um, you're not going to get exactly the same glinting pattern. You're not necessarily always going to get a PSF. Maybe you will see some extended and uh, dots now with a modern survey where you have much better seeing. But you could, in principle, simulate what you expect to see in the modern surveys, and you could maybe look for them. And that's one of the things we hope to do. Now, we look extensively at space debris we have to because there's so much debris from human spaceflight in orbit right now that <laughs> poses a danger to things like the international space station is it possible to look in that data set for evidence of these objects being there or are are they simply too far out in geosynchronous orbit compared to what we look for in leo I would be uh, doing two different things if I if I had uh, all the money, like all all the possible financing for the project. The first thing would be to actually look uh, among all these like glints produced by space debris today. And the second thing um, that I would like to do, I actually wrote an email to our company some days ago. Unfortunately, they did not reply to me. Imagine if you could go to this. Um, well, if you if you could get to these geosynchronous orbits like some companies nowadays want to do. There are some space environment companies that want to clean up these orbits, for example, with a big fishing net. Now, if you would get all this uh, debris, or not all this debris, but let's say a lot of debris, and take it down to Earth, how could you see the difference between our debris and uh, something that has been there for, let's say, thousands of years? Well, the reflective material is going to be um, kind of um, much less reflective because you have radiation damage and you have also uh, a lot of micrometeorites holes if you have something that has been there for 1000 years or even just 200 years it will have much more of micrometeorite holes so you could possibly even identify the alien object or a non-human object by uh, looking at a number of these micrometeorite holes and that's one of the things that I would find very exciting to do. Sadly, the company didn't reply to me when I proposed it. Now, an alien origin for these objects to postulate that maybe there is a von Neumann probe or something of that nature that's 3D printing out, you know, um, probes to look at Earth and study our progress, perhaps. Now... Is geosynchronous orbit the ideal place that you would put such a thing if you were, you know, doing a surveillance operation on the human species? Well, we are putting things there ourselves all the time. So if I would be an alien, I'd put it there. Now, and the, the, obviously the <laughs> the uh, the advantage of that is is a global view. Now, can you look for? objects that aren't in geosynchronous orbit in these plates, meaning stuff that's that's going to smear, you know, in much lower orbit, because we use that obviously very extensively as well. So could you do a search, perhaps using citizen science, if you could get access to the uh, digitized plates for lower objects? Absolutely. And we want to do it as well. It just needs uh, like uh, slight reprogramming because now we wouldn't be looking for uh, um, point sources, we would be looking for these streaks. So um, 
it's a little bit more work, but we want to do it. And I am especially interested in looking for things that would have so-called dashed lines. That would be um, like maybe on lower orbit, but also rotating so that you not always have the reflective surface in one direction. Now, effects of the sun. Um, you, I, you can have a situation where radiation pressure from the sun can move an object. Can you account for that with these, these geosynchronous ones, or is, it, is the effect just not there in that orbit? I, in I other wouldn't words, can even, you, can you, I wouldn't even can you try look for that. movement? <laughs> really? I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't bother about that at this point. I think one needs to have much more material and better data than what we're going to get. Now, is there a possibility, an analog of photographic plates in radio astronomy, in early radio astronomy, that might, you know, pick up a signal or something from such a probe? I actually do not know the answer to that question. I've been wondering a lot about when were the first radio uh, survey done, and I still haven't figured it out. I didn't check it up, but it would certainly be interesting. Because it would be interesting, and I, 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 I th one of the earliest ones, comprehensive ones that I know was was done by the Big Ear, which is the same radio telescope that picked up the Wow signal in the 1960s. I think the late 1960s, and I don't know of any comprehensive radio <clears throat> work before that, other than maybe I don't know Penzias and Wilson or something like that. But that was accidental. But maybe one should do a similar Vasco thing to take the first uh, radio sky thing and look for all the sources that have vanished today. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be interesting. If, if the data exists, I don't know, because radio astronomy obviously isn't as, uh, as comprehensive and early as the photographic plates are. Now, what other photographic plate sets are, could you target to try to look for other transients? I know the Vatican has some. But there are also, I, I believe, Harvard has plates and things like that, that that go back to the 1890s. And if you were to find something from the 1890s, then <laughs> it certainly wasn't human, right? I'd love to use the Harvard place, but it still uh, remains to be seen whether we will ever get access to them. So um, maybe there are other alternatives. I, I think there are... Also, like beyond the Vatican Observatory, there are also um, some plates from a Crimean Observatory. Now, I don't know how easy it might be to get access to those plates, given the political situation. But we have very good collaborators in Ukraine that uh, might be able to help out here. Now, in regards to looking at the plates themselves and contamination, what can happen to an old photographic plate that might mimic this effect? If to be honest, I don't know of any uh, um, direct things that can happen to an old uh, photographic plate that produce contamination that looks identical to stars and has star-like profiles with different intensities uh, having matching uh, um, full, full with half maximus as the real stars. I don't know what kind of contamination that could produce that. However, it is possible that maybe radioactive fallout um, could produce some type of these um, stars. However, there is one fallout. little thing uh, related to this, and that is that we actually looked at the plates that we had from 1950 and checked if there were any atomic bomb tests nearby, and there were no registered official atomic bomb tests that year. So I don't know if that is a reasonable hypothesis or not, but that was the only thing we kind of um, possibly could suggest. Maybe there are some other processes during uh, the plate production or so that could produce some type of point-like sources. and. Uh, even if you produce them, the question is whether these uh, sources would all have perfect profiles in one and the same image, or if only, or if it's extremely unlikely that you would have four or five or ten of them that all would have perfect star-like profiles in the same image. I don't know. This it, this is the thing I'm mostly confused by. So, nuclear testing 
<laughs> that seems to stretch. You know that that oh. a nuclear a nuclear test would create this profile of anomalies within a plate. I there's mean, it just a, doesn't seem. There's a paper by uh, um, someone called I forgot his first name, but it's a web uh, in 1949 where they, where an engineer saw some type of star-like objects on an X-ray plate, and that was that happened apparently during the t- Trinity test or so. But it was an X-ray film while we are having red emulsions. I don't know if the same thing would be seen on a red emulsion. I think it's much more unlikely. It does seem that way. Hmm. Um, so, where do you go from here? You know, what what is the the plan to um, verify these and just sort of lay out what you intend to do uh, to extend this research? So, the first thing I want to do is to search for um, better examples that are st- more statistically improbable. So something that is so improbable that we don't even need to care about the original photographic place because we would say oh if this is this is this impossibly can be some plate defects by this uh, absolutely perfect alignment that we find so that's one of the things i want to do uh, with the same plate material that we have and also look for these dashed lines that's the first step the second step will be um, hoping that we at some point can get direct access to the original photographic plates travel there and actually say whether they are real or not. And if we have a single of these candidates is real, then that's already fantastic. So these are the first steps we are going to do. And the third is to search for them in modern surveys. And uh, I, this is a step I want to start very soon, because even if we can't get access to the old photographic plates, if we can find these objects with the predicted glinting patterns in the modern surveys, then we are uh, then we are doing quite well. Now, extending that further, so say you look at the modern surveys and you confirm that these are there and are still there, what observations can you do? I mean, can you get some instrument time on, on something to take a look at them right now. In other words, uh, confirm that if they're there, they're still there. Um, what's that look like? Well, I would hope to speak to some of the people who have, uh, like, um, doesn't the military have like access to radars uh, that follow or track objects at geosynchronous orbits? Because maybe one could speak to them. Maybe they would be interested to help. That's one of the possibilities. And maybe it would even be possible to, if you know, if you can localize them, maybe you can make or design a space mission to, or talk to people that in 10 or 20 years time, someone would go there and pick them up. Now, do you anticipate if you went to the military and asked for radar data, they would give it to you or would they classify it and say, we can't tell you what the error bars are? You know, and you run into problems there. <laughs> Is that something that you expect? Uh, I didn't think of that. Um, I guess it depends on which country's military. You know, that's true. You could go perhaps to Sweden, or exactly. you know, exactly. I'm sure. I'm sure plenty of people are looking. You know, I'm sure every country on Earth is looking. <laughs> so you don't really need the Russians or the Americans. You could ask. You know, I, I don't know if. <laughs> There's plenty to ask. Um, we are international cooperation. We try all countries we can. <laughs> yeah, try every one of them. <laughs> eventually, eventually you get you get your data from you know I don't know France or something like that. Um, well, th- this is definitely a puzzler. You know, this is definitely something that that just needs to be followed up on and seen because if if there were alien objects in orbit of Earth and we missed it. <laughs> we've missed it this entire time, then perhaps we should reevaluate the idea of calling ourselves an advanced civilization. <laughs> and all ears must be open. All eyes and all ears must be open with this stuff. We have to sort of drop the the stigmas regarding um, the question of alien life, especially close alien life, and try to answer the question once and for all. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. But there is also one more interpretation that could be, and that is that this has nothing to do with glints on uh, geosynchronous orbits. It could also be that 
and multiple transients are a very rare phenomena that happens on the sky for some other physical reason and we just don't know what is this reason now it could be a completely new phenomenon and that has never and been it recorded could, it would be equally it could cool be a, i would say it could be a scary one too that that earth ensnares objects <laughs> and and holds them in a temporary orbit and that <laughs> one of them could fall on us even if it's just an asteroid a highly reflective metallic asteroid or something like that it's something that we need to know about right it, it could be something completely completely different than what we uh, like even imagine it just that uh, the geosynchronous uh, object explanation has a clear physical scenario that we can propose while there might be something with new physics that we cannot right now imagine and this has happened before because if you would have said um time dilation exists in the universe if you'd have told a scientist in 1880 that 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 was the case they would not have believed you exactly it happens all the time we learn all the time that's why this right, is Beatrice. to follow up on thanks again for joining us and i uh, look forward to your next paper and we'll do this again perfect thanks a lot for inviting me Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.